In July 2008, Randy Pausch lost his battle with cancer. And in November 2008, I had a meeting with Arthur Gillis, the legendary chair of the Cape Town GLC. We met in New York City on November 5th. The night before, I'd been in Times Square, planted right in front of that jumbotron. I don't care what your politics are, I watched my country elect Barack Obama, our first black president, and it was an amazing night, a night of hope and dreams and possibilities. When I met with Arthur the next day to talk to him about our ideas for this first ever spouse summit, he asked me point blank, oh, Pam, Pam, if you could get anyone in the world, anyone to speak to your group of spouses, to inspire them, who would it be? And I didn't even need to think about it. I said, Jay Pausch. Jay is not a celebrity. She's not on the lecture circuit. She doesn't have an agent or a handler, trust me. <laughs> She's just a woman who met the man of her dreams, a man with big dreams of his own. And they had a family. And that man was Randy Pausch. He was a professor at Carnegie Mellon University. And their story moved me and, in fact, became a cultural juggernaut here in America and in 38 languages around the world. It moved me because I could totally relate, as can all of us, to living with a dreamer and being the one to provide perspective. I thought her story would resonate with us all. So everyone, I'd like you to meet Jay Pausch. Look at that. <laughs> I'm so happy you're here. Well, thank you very much. Okay, thank well, you very we, much. I'm gonna tell you something. In YPO, um, we have this thing, it's called being forum confidential. Right? Okay. So I just want to let you know that these are all your friends. This is your 400 person forum right oh, here. <laughs> Jay has, was, has been asked to speak to Oprah and Diane Sawyer and People Magazine and I joked with her that I was so happy that she picked me over Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> But I know you picked me because I'm not Oprah. <laughs> and we wear the same toenail. That's right. Let's just take them off. All right. All right. Because um, my feet are killing here. me. All right. So here we are. I'm reading this book. My husband doesn't read any books, right? He, uh, the last book he read was uh, Catch-22 and Catcher in the Rye. He, he can only read books with catch in the title. Or books like Swim with the Sharks and, you know, Kill Other Leaders and oh, Make Your yeah, Business yeah, yeah. Bigger and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I said, you have to read this book. This is the most amazing book. And... He, it really moved him because he said to me, what Randy said is, my wife provided perspective. And uh, the thing that moved me was that he told his story with such verve and energy. And I think the reason he made a difference with his story is because he did it without any self-pity. But I want to know your story. You know, it's in yeah. here a little bit, like he talks about you and yeah. your children. And, um, but I want to know about Jay Pausch. And what were your dreams when you were a child? Well, and, and that's something that was covered a, a little bit in the book. Um, you know, the, the dreams that I had as, as a child, sometimes I would want, you know, think about, like many girls, uh, wanting to have my own horse or... Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, not me. <laughs> no, you, you, no. Know, you were no question. I'm from Staten Island. Oh, you, well. yeah. <laughs> you want your own you cab. Want, you want, right. <laughs> So, so you wanted your own horse, well, and uh, any other dreams? I wanted to go to France. Right. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to grow up and have children. I wanted to get married one day and, and, and have children. So and many of your dreams were realized. Many, many, many were. But what, what was your, your, I was going to say, what was, your, what was your work? I would always say BK, before kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had this fantastic title. Um, I was the director of electronic publications at the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University. So I should also say that Jay is very, <laughs> very <laughs> humble. She's um, uh, all but dissertation on her PhD um, in comparative literature and French. And she even, she's a geek, she knows how to yeah. read computer code, which uh, she's trying to get me to understand Facebook, and I know we'll figure it out sometime. <laughs> but the thing I, I was interested in, Randy said that, you're, that you were one of the brick walls <laughs> that he had to traverse. He talks about in the book 
having brick walls, and brick walls mm -hmm. are there mm -hmm. for those who are going to scale them or go through them. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about how you met and uh, a little bit about how you were a brick wall for him. Well, we, um, well at the time I was a graduate student at, um, at UNC Chapel Hill, and I was working on my PhD in comparative literature. Um, at, and I was running out of funding, so I was working part-time in the Department of Computer Science, and I ran their outreach program. So when you had visiting professors come in, we would set up demonstrations for them to get an understanding of uh, what kind of research we were doing mm -hmm. in uh, computer science there. So I had arranged for demonstrations for Randy DC because he was coming in as a guest lecturer. And then I got to um, learn about his research where he was um, creating software uh, so that young kids in middle school and high school and college um, would have an easier way of getting introduced to computer programming with, uh, without getting bogged down with the syntax. Um, and so I thought, hey, this would work out really well with our outreach program. Right. I want to meet with him and talk with him about that. And from there, we met and we started dating. Oh, he night. pursued <laughs> you, right? I mean, he yeah, started sending he you gifts and flowers, flowers. and stuffed animals. Yeah. He, was, uh, he was a romantic. Did, yeah, did you like that? I did. You know, it's funny. He, um, uh, he asked the department head where I worked um, if he had the department head's permission to um, pursue me. Ah! <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like asking your me. dad. Yes, it's like asking my dad. Oh, how funny. Yeah, it was permission. Just, yeah, I was asking but permission. But then you, to you do did that. decide to take the plunge. Um, there was a little blip there where you're like, I'm not coming with you to Pittsburgh. Well, I had, to, I had to give up my job, leave my friends and family, and move to Pittsburgh where I knew nobody and, and you know, start a new career there. And um, we weren't engaged. Um, we weren't going to oh, live no, together. Oh no, honey, you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to see how things were going to go. So uh -huh. we were, you know, moving slowly, but still, it was very scary. And Randy's he's real intense. He's very, um, you know, he was at that time. He was uh, he was more into it than I was because I was I was really scared. I had been married once before, had been divorced, didn't want to go that path uh. again, and I was. Very gun shy. The starter marriage. The star yeah, I got that <laughs> so, over with. <laughs> but you, uh, but you took the plunge, I and, did. and I think he's so, quite persuasive. Well, he said the best things in life are worth scaling the brick wall for, and yeah. uh, he said that was you. So your life together, you had your first child, and I know you had to overcome adversity with the birth of Dylan. Yeah, uh, because he was born seven weeks early, and he was two pounds fifteen ounces, and. Um, it, you know, it never dawned on me that he might die, but other people later on said, wow, I, I really thought your baby was going to die. And I just was so, you know, that just not was, my head wasn't there, but um, I could see where the circumstances would. So you made a choice. People. Your life changed. You were working. Mm -hmm. You, uh, we seem to, this seems to be somewhat thematic. Uh, you've heard from Leslie Morgan Steiner about the yeah. mommy wards. Tell, uh, share with everyone the story you told me about how you decided uh, to stay home with the kids and what you wanted Randy to do. Oh, so um, we of course had talked a lot about having children, and um, you know the the idea of staying home with these kids was really scary to me because I thought, you know, what if. Um, what if later on down the road he finds a younger woman and, and I'm no longer working and, and you know that puts me in a financially difficult situation? Um, what if anything ever happens to him? Uh, and so I was I was really hesitant to um, to leave my job and so and Dylan was born preemie. It was it was really hard for us um, to put him in daycare right away because he was um, quarantined to the house for three months. So. As time wore on um, and I was staying home with him, I, I decided that I, I, I just couldn't put him in daycare. I couldn't, um, I was going to stay home with him. But I told Randy the caveat was that he had to get a life insurance policy. <laughs> and, and he wouldn't do it, right? He wouldn't. He was so, you know, here's a man who, um, he has his priority list. He gets, uh, he would make lists, list and list, And he would get things done and check them off his list. Um, and that was one thing he seemed to never get around to. On the bottom to. of the list. <laughs> yes. uh, and right. so um, I just used some persuasive power and finally got him to get on the internet and he found something that was reasonable. And Well, it's funny, you talk about persuasive power. The thing that struck Neil for, for him in this book is how you provided perspective. And I think as spouses, male or female, we tend to provide perspective for each other. In our house, my husband calls that nagging. Nagging. Yes. <laughs> yes. I have 
funny how that is. <laughs> and you even talk in the book about how, you know, here you had to start writing down in a journal because you didn't want to tell him to pick up his clothes. So why is it perspective? Why was it perspective in your house? What's the difference? Yeah. Do you think about providing perspective or does it just happen naturally? Well, in the <laughs> beginning, you know, it's perspective. It's, it's, it's the nagging. But then I got into this conundrum where um, he's sick and dying. Right. And I'm the caregiver. And um, it's really hard to say to somebody who's sick and dying, can't you please pick up your clothes and just put it in the hamper there? Yeah, but he did that when he was healthy. So what did you no. say then? No. <laughs> <laughs> then it was nagging. It's like, could you just put them in the hamper? Well, uh, or I just, you know, was, uh, yeah. So, so it, got, it, it, it was a lot. It got more difficult when we were in that place of him being sick and, and me trying to carry more of the load in the relationship, right. which you would expect at that time. And every relationship goes through that where you're doing hopefully 50-50, but then right. at times in the relationship you're doing 80 and he's doing 20. Um, right, the give and take. The give and take. But it is, uh, it's amazing because I think in so many ways spouses all, all, all our spouses, we give each other perspective. Mm -hmm. That's the point. Mm -hmm. I met my husband, this is 25 years ago, on a, on a bus in London on a semester abroad, and wow. he said, I have to marry a girl with perspective. And I'm like, oh, that's a big word. I, I don't have that. <laughs> but now uh, I, I think that we, uh, we appreciate that together. Yeah. But talk about perspective with a big P. All of a sudden, you are raising three small children, and uh, you've got this diagnosis that, that comes to you very suddenly. And I know it must have been shocking because he's healthy, he's vibrant, mm -hmm. he's busy, he's dad and husband. Tell me about that and how that was for the two of you when you received the cancer diagnosis. Um, it starts off real slow because uh, he hadn't been feeling well, and um, we, you know, we thought it was the flu, and we thought it was strep, and then we thought, um, you know, he's got some weird virus. Then we thought maybe it's hepatitis. So then they started testing him for hepatitis, um, and he he was just sure he had hepatitis C because he had all the classic symptoms for hepatitis C, and nobody would suspect um, that a 45-year-old man had pancreatic cancer because that's that skews 20 years younger um, than what the, the typical yeah, right. um, cancer patient, can't get a cancer patient has. So they weren't looking in that direction. And um, we, were, we were in a rental house raising the roof of our ranch house. Um, and so we're you know, discombobulated and displaced. Um, and, and he's not feeling well. And we have a three-month-old um, baby and then two other small children under the age of five. Um, and, you know, they figured out when he turned jaundice that something was up, and they scanned him. Um, and the the doctor called us. Our our um, primary care physician called us because um, he was at that time leading the charge to figure out what was wrong. Sure. So he calls us, and it's um, Saturday morning of Labor Day weekend, and he says, um, "This isn't fair, um, but there's you know we've seen a mass on his pancreas," and. The doctor tells Randy, and then Randy, you know, hands the phone to me because the doctor wants to tell me personally. So while the doctor is telling me this, Randy is sitting on the bed with his laptop, and he is Googling pancreatic cancer. He's researching. <laughs> He's already researching it. <laughs> yes. um, and I, I hang up the phone, and he said, I'm going to die from this um, because the statistics show that um, the majority of people die within the first year, um, if not the first six weeks. So um, because the odds were so low, Right. Um, we planned for a worst case scenario, um, and there were a lot of tears, a, you know, a lot of um, a lot of hugs, and a lot of holding, and it was it was devastating. I mean, it was just uh, absolutely hard to wrap our heads around. And in the meantime, I, I can, I, what I can't wrap you were you just had a baby three months before, yeah. So you're exhausted. They're not sleeping through the night. Yep. You've got two other rambunctious kids. You had have to continue with your life. Yes. You know, we heard that from the Correos. You know, yeah. he's kidnapped, but she's got to put the kids to bed. How do you do this? How do you go through, I mean... How do you not do it? Well, how do you, you know, how do you look your children in the face and they're hungry for breakfast and you say, you know, yeah. I'm feeling too sad to, to make any breakfast right. for you. You're just going to have to be hungry. I mean, <laughs> Don't you, I, mean I, I really think, talk about perspective well. with a big P. 
<laughs> it's that child who needs, you know, you know, take take me, mommy, now. Yeah. That's and if you don't breastfeed, it, it yeah, hurts. That's um, right. So. <laughs> <laughs> so you breastfeed. Okay, exactly. So you know, you, they keep you going, but then also um, you, you have to move forward. I mean, you get. We were. At, there were many 